Hello, everyone. My name is Mindy Rabinowitz, and I'm one of the rhinologists and endoscopic skull base surgeons at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Today, I'll be talking about acute and chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge one of my co-authors, Dr. Alexander Duffy, who contributed quite a bit to this presentation today. I am a consultant for Integra Life Sciences. However, uh, this will not conflict with anything that I discussed today. By way of today's outline, we'll first start with talking a little bit about uh, acute and invasive fungal sinusitis and just fungi in the environment. We'll then move on to talk a little bit more about acute invasive fungal sinusitis, including its epidemiology, clinical manifestations, imaging diagnosis, biopsy and treatment. The same will then be true for chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis, and then we'll end with some conclusions and key points. And uh, finally, we'll end with a few suggested reading options. So in terms of an introduction, <clears throat> uh, fungal sinusitis occurs as a result of exposure to fungal spores within the environment, which occupy the very air we breathe. Uh, fungal sinusitis is characterized into two broad categories, invasive and non-invasive. For classification of invasive fungal sinusitis, distinguishing criteria were first proposed by DeShazo et al. in 1997. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those uh, distinguishing characteristics are. But first, we'll move on to just fungi in the environment. So fungi are heterotrophic eukaryotes, meaning that they are unable to synthesize their own sustenance. To obtain nutrients, food is digested extracellularly via enzymes. With an estimated 5 million species, fungi are innumerable and inescapable in everyday life. With each breath, we inhale fungal spores orders greater in magnitude than normal allergens, up to a thousand times more so. Fungi uh, remain dormant as spores in the environment until their environment is optimal enough to favor growth. And with global climate change upon us, the incidence of both invasive and non-invasive fungal sinusitis stands to increase in prevalence. Both fungal colonization of plants and spore production increase in some fungal species with higher, higher carbon dioxide levels and higher temperatures will alter allergen sensitization rates. Now, fungi uh, exist on a continuum within the human body that ranges from benign colonization to frank invasion. Uh, spores may trigger an immunologic process and elimination, but fungi may also exist within normal sinonasal flora. Invasive fungal sinusitis occurs when human barriers of immunity, including mucosal surfaces within the respiratory tract, as well as the innate and adaptive immunity, namely neutrophils and granulocytes, cease to function to their full potential. And uh, thermotolerant fungi such as aspergillus can inhabit the respiratory tract and is one of the most common kinds of fungi that we'll see in uh, invasive, and, uh, invasive and chronic um, fungal sinusitis. So first we'll move on to acute invasive fungal sinusitis or AIFS. Uh, now acute invasive fungal sinusitis is a rare condition that has a propensity to infect, but not exclusively so, immune, immunocompromised or diabetic patients. Um, additional risk factors include sinonasal abnormalities affecting normal drainage pathways, burns, chronic iron overload, such as in patients with renal failure, solid organ transplant recipients, uh, bone marrow transplant patients, and long-term corticosteroid use. The uh, mortality rate of AIFS, unfortunately, is very high and can range anywhere from about 50 to 80%. However, recent studies cite rates as low as 20% when disease is recognized early and approached with a multimodal therapy and reversal of the immunocompromised state, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, poor prognostic factors established within the literature include delayed diagnosis, <clears throat> older patients, intracranial orbital spread, aplastic anemia, or lack of surgical intervention. Uh, intracranial spread identified in imaging is the highest predictive indicator of disease-specific mortality, and about half of patients um, affected with AIFS are poorly controlled diabetics. 
uh, the the acidotic glucose rich environment is ideal for fungal growth. Patients in diabetic ketoacidosis are additionally adversely affected as phagocytosis is diminished in these patients. Diabetic patients uh, also face an overall lower mortality rate compared to immunocompromised, so, excuse me, to immunocompetent patients, likely attributable to, attributable to the more readily irreversible disease state. The remaining majority of patients are largely, are largely immunosuppressed with conditions including hematologic malignancy, patients with neutropenia secondary to chemotherapy, AIDS, HIV, and transplant patients. Uh, neutropenia is the most common predisposing factor to AIFS. A small subset of patients may be in iron overload or undergoing iron chelation therapy. Uh, specifically, the species rhizopus may bind to extracellular iron in patients being treated uh, with iron therapy. Uh, prognostic indicators for IFS are variable, but increased mortality in the literature has been demonstrated in patients with altered mental status, hepatorenal failure, intracranial involvement, or neutropenia. Neutrophil counts of less than uh, 1,000 millimeters, cubic millimeters are seen as a negative prognostic indicator. So by definition, the duration of uh, AIFS is less than four weeks. Symptoms of acute invasive fungal sinusitis are often nonspecific in nature upon presentation, mimicking bacterial sinusitis or orbital cellulitis. These include persistent headache, epistaxis, congestion, nasal obstruction, facial pressure, or pain. Fever may or may not be present, especially in the immunocompromised patients. Uh, AIFS is a rapidly, pro uh, rapidly progresses over days to weeks. Uh, and to clinical deterioration when surrounding structures as the orbit brain and cavernous sinus are affected via direct vascular invasion. Symptoms include <clears throat> uh, facial swelling and erythema, skin lesions, ophthalmoplegia, diplopia and visual loss, third and fourth and sixth cranial nerve palsy, palsy secondary to cavernous sinus inv involvement, altered mental status, and additional cranial neuropathies with skull base involvement. <clears throat> Intracranial spread uh, may result in cerebritis, granulomas, or abscess formation. Uh, even in late disease, patients may still be mi misdiagnosed. A retrospective uh, study conducted by Threff et al. demonstrated an average time from symptom onset to diagnosis of, of about 10.3 days in patients with orbital complications. Patients with orbital complications are uh, often empirically treated with steroids or conditions such as or for conditions such as giant cell arteritis, optic neuritis, or idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, thereby prolonging uh, official diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so this is just an example of some clinical manifestations of AIFS that may be seen on initial presentation. Um, on the left of the screen um, in uh, panel B, you can see evidence of pallidal necrosis. Uh, and on the right side, you can see bilateral facial swelling and erosions of the maxilla. Uh, I will comment that these often tend to be late findings of AIFS. And as mentioned, usually the earlier findings are a little bit more subtle um, and are often confused with just routine bacterial sinusitis. When you get to the point of seeing these late complications such as palatal necrosis or orbital complications, um, they're usually pretty far along in, um, in progression. This is an example, another example of um, a more advanced presentation of AIFS. On the left of the screen, you can see that this patient came in um, presenting with uh, ophthalmoplegia of the right eye. Um, here, her, her pupil is dilated pharmacologically after ophthalmologic examination, but you can see her orbit is sort of fixed in a down and out position. She was also proptotic and had significant periorbital edema. While it might be a little hard to appreciate, you can see some black crust crusting at her right nostril, which is actually evidence of necrosis within the nostril. Uh, if you look to the right of the screen, you can actually see that a little bit better. Again, that black crusting, which was uh, necrosis within the right nostril. And if you look at the um, hard palate, again, you can see a, a central circular region of just frank necrosis of the hard palate. Again, these tend to be late manifestations of AIFS. So the cornerstone um, for diagnosis uh, of AIFS relies on prompt evaluation, including, including a thorough physical examination, imaging, and biopsies. Um, physical exam findings of AFS, AIFS were first described in 1957, presenting as painless necrotic septal ulcer with overt sinusitis. Uh, 
Uh, nasal endoscopy is paramount, of course, for diagnosis, and additional endoscopic findings include mucosal changes such as ischemia, pallor, or changes in color, coloration of the mucosa, as well as crusting. The middle termitate most commonly displays these changes, while less commonly they may be seen on the septum, hard palate, uh, or inferior turbinate. And as the disease progresses, the mucosa may become insensate, as previously pale mucosa becomes black and necrotic. Septal perfin perforation may even be present in advanced disease. Ulceration, necrosis, and anesthesia of the hard palate may also be present in advanced disease, as we previously discussed. As the disease spreads beyond the sinus, adjacent structures such as the orbit and brain will show signs of involvement. Advanced orbital disease may demonstrate signs of ischemia, uh, uh, signaling central ret retinal uh, artery occlusion, uh, and patients may develop limited extraocular movements as well as ptosis. So upon first suspicion of AF AIFS, imaging should be obtained uh, urgently. Uh, to start, non-contrast CT should be obtained and uh, monitored for bony paranasal sinus changes. Common findings uh, on CT are usually nonspecific and may include unilateral asymmetric mucosal thickening, secondary to ischemia or inflammation. Uh, the most common early CT finding uh, for AIFS is uh, severe unilateral mucosal thickening. Uh, unilateral ethmoid and sphenoid involvement is also common. As AIFS spreads uh, via direct vascular invasion and not via local destruction, bony walls may remain intact with extra sinus extension present. Uh, maxillary periantral antral fat invasion is a specific finding for AIFS that may be present early in disease. Uh, so here are two examples of CT findings in AIF AIFS uh, from Arbandi et al. On the left-hand side, you see an axial contrast enhanced CT scan, which demonstrates unilateral right-sided ethmoid and sphenoid sinus mucosal disease and thickening. The arrow delineates bony erosion and destruction of the right sphenoid sinus with extension into the cavernous sinus. On the right-hand side, um, here we see a right maxillary sinus periantral fat, uh, which is showing signs of invasion, which is a specific sign for AIFS. So MRI um, can also be obtained when extra sinus disease is suspected. Changes within the maxillary sinus are common, followed by the sphenoid sinus, nasal cavity, and ethmoid sinus. Affected mucosa will appear isointense to muscle on T1-weighted imaging and hypointense uh, on T2-weighted imaging. Soft tissue patterns uh, on contrast-enhanced MRI can reflect endoscopic and surgical findings with lack of enhancement uh, significant for necrosis and high fungal load, while mucosal enhancement demonstrates inflammation, fibrosis, and granulation. A recent study showed that lack of contrast enhancement on MRI may serve as a prognostic factor for disease-free survival. Common manifestations include black turbinate sign, and, which is a lack of contrast enhancement. Here are two examples of MRI findings in AIFS. On the left, you can see a loss of contrast enhancement seen uh, as focal areas of disease within the right ethmoid sinus and orbit. On the right, resulting cavernous sinus invasion. On the right, is, on the right uh, secondary to sphenoid sinus invasion excuse me, uh, sphenoid sinus uh, invasive fungal disease. Note that on T1-weighted imaging uh, of the MRI, fungal disease is isointense to muscle. So um, fungal culture from biopsies or surgical debridement serves as a use useful um, but tenacious tool. Uh, fungal cultures are slow to grow and up to 30% of cultures may not harbor any growth. Thus multiple modalities uh, should be pursued for diagnosis. Timely biopsies, uh, are paramount to accurate diagnosis of uh, acute invasive fungal sinusitis, and prompt biopsies uh, of areas with mucosal change are required. Biopsies of areas, um, particularly around the middle turbinate, are both highly specific and sensitive for AIFS. Additional sites uh, for targeted biopsy include the nasal septum and floor of the na nasal cavity. Uh, sites for biopsy uh, will demonstrate increased mucosal bleeding. Uh, excuse me, decreased mucosal bleeding if involved with uh, AIFS. Uh, frozen biopsy um, should be stained with H&E uh, and is widely available and demonstrates a high accurate, uh, highly accurate methodology for quick turnaround on specimens. Uh, adjunct staining with uh, a Gamori 
methamine silver stain, uh, which deposits silver onto fungal uh, cell walls may eliminate false negatives. If frozen suction is unavailable, about uh, 10 to 20% uh, solution of potassium hydroxide staining may serve in fungal detection for pump initiation of antifungal therapy. The hallmark of uh, invasive um, compared to non-invasive fungal sinusitis is the presence of invasion beyond the mucosal lining of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. This includes bone and importantly into vascular structures. Hyphal presence and invasion into the submucosal structures including vessels along with tissue necrosis and mild inf inflammatory infiltrate are present. Uh, speciation via microscopy provides uh, clarity and direct and will help to direct antifungal choice. Thus, uh, differentiation between aspergillus and mucormycosis is key. Aspergillus hyphae demonstrate a uniform acute angled branching pattern with septations, while mucormycosis hyphae are aseptate, broad and irregular, with a branching at 90 degree angles. A newer methodology, such as an in situ hybridization and PCR, are currently under investigation for fungal speciation when culture is negative and histopathology is unreliable. Here are two permanent uh, stains, as described by Christ et al. The left biopsy specimen uh, demonstrates a thin, acute branching pattern seen on GMS stain. GMS stain can be used to eliminate false negatives when large areas of necrosis are present on the specimen. Uh, this also represents uh, an aspergillus staining pattern. On the right, we have a biopsy uh, demonstrating the broad-based aseptic characteristic of mucormycosis. Uh, these may be folded onto themselves during the uh, processing process. This is an H&E stain, uh, again provided by Chris et al, demonstrating thrombosis uh, of the vascular structure secondary to fungal invasion of the fungal hyphae. So after timely diagnosis of AIFS, the cornerstone of management are threefold and include reversing the immunocompromised state or unfavorable patient status, surgery when a available or applicable, and initiation of broad spectrum antifungal treatments. Appropriate initiation of treatment can lower mortality up to 18%. First line antifungal therapy begins with amphotericin B, which has a notorious adverse drug reaction profile of nephrotoxicity, thrombophlebitis, and cardiac arrhythmias. Newer, more expensive formulations of liposomal amphotericin B has a lower toxicity profile and may be better tolerated. Studies comparing um, Deoxychlorate and liposomal formulations suggest superiority of the liposomal formulations. Amphotericin is active against both mucor mycosis as well as aspergillus, and typically treatment duration is about six to eight weeks. If, a, if patients are refractory or intolerant to amphotericin, additional options include uh, isobuconazole, and if aspergillus has um, been identified, patients can be switched to voriconazole, uh, which has been demonstrated to improve survival. <clears throat> Along with the initiation of antifungal therapy, patients should be prepared for possible operative intervention <clears throat> and unfavorable underlying states should be addressed. In patients with diabetic ketoacidosis, um, Patients should have control of their blood glucose and insulin uh, with adequate fluid resusc resuscitation. Iron overload should be corrected, and any immunocompromised state should be improved if applicable. Uh, granulocyte and macrophage, macrophage colony stimulating factor and interferon gamma may improve neutrophil counts, and recovery from neutropenia has been found to be the most reliable indicator of survival. Optimization of patients' medical status and underlying comorbidity should be addressed, and platelet transfusion should be initi initiated uh, and uh, with a goal of a count to above 60 to mitigate any intraoperative or postoperative hemorrhage. So in order to identify which patients would benefit from antifungal therapy alone versus combination therapy of antifungals and surgery, AIFS has been categorized into three broad stages. In stage one, uh, diseases limited to the nasal cavity or paranasal sinuses, these patients benefit from endoscopic debridement and antifungal therapy. In stage two, patients may be uh, successfully treated with a combined endoscopic and or open approach along with antifungal therapy, and this involves more rhino orbital uh, extension of disease. <clears throat> 
And finally, in stage three, these patients have more severe disease, which includes not only the cytonasal cavities and orbit, but also intracranial involvement. Here, complete extirpation of disease may not be possible or may be extremely morbid to perform. High rates of treatment failure are noted within this group. If possible, uh, operative intervention is undertaken, and if not, um, antifungal therapy should be undertaken. So in terms of surgery, the goals of surgery are, of course, complete eradication of disease to healthy or reduce to healthy um, bleeding tissue. Uh, the goal being to try to reduce the uh, fungal burden uh, thereby and also improving antifungal penetration of uh, medication. Uh, surgery also helps us to obtain cultures and microscopic samples, um, one to confirm diagnosis, but also to help guide treatment. Uh, surgical treatment for AIFS can be dealt with on a continuum of uh, one versus multiple procedures, as well as with minimally invasive endoscopic approaches versus maximally invasive procedures uh, or open approaches, such as maxillectomy, orbitotomy, orbital exoneration, or craniotomy. Within the literature, surgical resection has been shown to be an independent predictor of sur uh, survival. One must consider that patients that do not undergo surgery have demonstrated poor survivor rates, but this may be secondary to higher disease burden as well as coexisting medical conditions. Partial resection of disease, even when combined with antifungal therapy, has shown decreased survival compared to complete resection. Uh, and endoscopic surgery is highly successful at identifying abnormal appearing mucosa, facilitating postoperative surveillance with wide approaches such as turbinectomy and medial maxillectomy, and accessing orbital structures via the lamina papricia. A recent study advocates uh, for a bilateral sinus debridement, including medial maxillectomy, followed by close up. Uh, follow up with planned debridements to reduce need for repeat procedures under general anesthesia. The surgeon must also consider pursuing bilateral endoscopic approaches even without radiologic or clinical evidence of contralateral disease as occult disease has been detected in contralateral sinuses and should always be considered. The treatment of AIFS really should be multi-specialty and multidisciplinary. Um, and this is for several reasons. Orbital involvement may serve as a harbinger of intracranial involvement via structures such as the optic canal, superior orbital fissure, or ophthalmic artery. And up to one in five patients with AIFS uh, face orbital exoneration for control of disease. Recently described approaches to the uh, orbit uh, involved combined endoscopic endonasal approaches with endoscopic orbital approaches via a palpebral conjunctival incision in order to accurately eradicate fungal disease located superior and laterally in the orbit while preserving visual acuity and uh, being able to forego uh, disfiguring exoneration, again, only if possible. Uh, so this is an example of a patient uh, who came into our hospital uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And uh, he came in otherwise with no known medical history. Uh, he was diagnosed with COVID and had a pretty rapid and severe um, course from his COVID, developing COVID pneumonia, uh, sepsis, uh, new onset AFib, which was severe in nature, uh, as well as a GI bleed. Uh, within a couple of weeks of his hospital stay, he then um, was noted to have ophthalmoplegia on the right side. Uh, and this is an examination from the ophthalmologist examining him. Again, his pupils here are dilated pharmacologically. Look all the way up to the ceiling. Look over to the left. Look down to your toes. And look straight ahead and down to your toes. And straight ahead and all the way to the right. Forward, you can to the right, straight ahead, and up. And here again, you can see straight pretty ahead. significant uh, restricted left. motility, particularly in up and down days, as well as down. with um, right eye down, 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 down. Um, This is the intraoperative. Uh, video from that patient. Um, now, this was interesting in that, as we previously talked about, many of these patients will have evidence of um, uh, mucosal pallor or frank necrosis of the mucosa, which just looks like black tissue, uh, which is not uh, going to bleed when you bite it. This was interesting is that when you looked in his nose, you actually saw a lot of these fungal spores uh, here up all along the, the sinonasal cavity. Of note, he had a history of previous endoscopic endoscopic sinus surgery years ago. So here again, you can see all these fungal spores just completely lining all of the sinonasal uh, mucosal uh, cavities. 
and there was also kind of a coexisting bacterial infection with mucopus back here. Uh, I'll show the video, but I will just mention that uh, his pathology uh, did actually reveal this to be aspergillus. See if this plays. There you go. Again, so here's those fungal spores. You can see uh, this was the right lamina propria. Here we're in the ethmoid cavity, sphenoid sinus. Uh, again, he had previous uh, endoscopic sinus surgery in the past. This is just all dead tissue, which was really just falling apart as we went in there to to suction it out and to breed it. There's also gross involvement of the lamina propria, and the bone uh, just sort of fell away as we were um, performing dissection. And again, there's some of that lamina propria bone that you can see there, which is frankly necrotic and black. Uh, his disease also extended into the orbit as well as the infraorbital nerve, uh, which was frankly necrotic and had to be resected. So this is him post-operatively uh, and on ophthalmologic examination. Look at my finger here, okay? Follow it all the way up, just your eyes. All the way to the right. Oh, so much better. Straight ahead, all the way up. All the way down. Lift your eyelids look all the way down for me. Look all the way up and all the way down. Good, straight ahead. And as you can see there, um, this was taken the day after surgery. He still has some restri restricted motility, uh, but overall it was improved, which again uh, speaks to the importance of very prompt uh, surgical management. So next we're going to switch gears and move on to chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. And chronic invasive fungal sinusitis is similar to acute invasive, but the infection and symptoms occur over a period of greater than 12 weeks. Again, uh, invasion under mucosa must be seen on final pathology, or actually I should say invasion into the mucosa uh, must be seen on final pathology to differentiate it um, from non-invasive fungal sinusitis. Now, chronic invasive fungal sinusitis uh, is a slow, um, has a slow unremitting course where relapse and disease persistence are very, very common. Uh, patients are typically not as profoundly immunocompromised as in AIFS. Um, with the majority of these patients being mildly diabetic or on chronic steroids. Um, additional immune competent patients may also be affected by chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. And uh, many of these patients have a history of chronic sinusitis or a history of uh, sinus trauma or dental work in the past. Rare cases within the literature describe conversion of chronic invasive fungal sinusitis from allergic fungal sinusitis in immunocompetent patients after prolonged treatment with oral and intranasal steroids. Progression from mycetoma has also been hypothesized. Um, chronic invasive fungal sinusitis is most commonly seen in Africa, India, Sudan, uh, although uh, cases have been identified in the West, in Western countries such as the United States. Presentation of chronic invasive fungal sinusitis is again nonspecific without rapid progression, which would typically be seen in acute invasive fungal sinusitis. Often patients have a history of chronic sinusitis with polyposis. Patients commonly present with uh, symptoms including discharge or rhinorrhea, proptosis, epistaxis, or unilateral facial pain. Less commonly and in more advanced disease, uh, patients may experience headaches, seizures, or cranial nerve palsies. Orbital apex syndrome uh, may occur as disease spreads to the posterior orbit, causing progressive vision loss and unilateral blindness. Chronic invasive fungal sinusitis is often misdiagnosed under a wide differential, including malignancy, uh, idiopathic orbital inflammation, or foreign bodies. Uh, clinical suspicion may be low as patients are typically relatively immunocompetent with vague complaints. Uh, examination is often significant for congestion, polypoid tissue, or perilent muco mucus. Uh, fungal burden or nasal masses may also be seen. Occasionally, a unilateral mass is found, and ophthalmologic findings may include, as mentioned, proptosis, uh, ophthalmoplegia, and orbital ex examination uh, may be significant for pallor erosion or fistula uh, if advanced disease is present. 
Uh, these are some um, pictures of clinical manifestations of chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. On the left, we have a report of a fungating orbital mass um, described by Singh et al. Uh, while the symptoms may initially be nonspecific, advanced disease may resemble malignancy in certain patients. On the right, it, this is a previously treated patient with open surgery for orbital floor involvement of um, fungal sinusitis with adjunct amphotericin treatment. Uh, she was noted to have chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, and she suffered several recurrences. This photo actually depicts recurrence as skin changes about five years postoperatively. Um, so providers, um, as I said before, um, tend to have a low clinical suspicion, especially secondary to the immunocompetent status. And these were the uh, differential that we previously discussed. Okay, so uh, in terms of diagnosis, although many patients present in a de delayed fashion due to misdiagnosis, concern should arise when patients present with vague sinus or orbital complaints um, unrelieved by steroids or antibiotics. Uh, Though the course uh, is often uh, slower moving in manner than acute invasive fungal sinusitis, there may be some similarities in presentation. Um, and imaging and biopsy should be obtained when possible. Uh, biopsy of affected tissue will demonstrate similar findings to AIFS, namely invasion of fungal um, hyphae into the submucosal structures, including bone, nerves, and vasculature, as well as frank necrosis. Uh, minimal inflammatory infiltrate may also be seen on, pre on uh, specimens. Uh, identif identification of the causative organism is key, and Aspergillus fumigatus is the most common causative organism for chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, although additional organisms can be seen, such as mucormycosis, rhizopus, bipolaris, and candida. So imaging should be obtained uh, to determine the extent of disease and involvement of surrounding structures. Non-contrast CT is quickly obtained and will delineate uh, a hyperattenuating soft tissue mass within one or more of uh, paranasal sinuses. Bony destruction may be present and differentiation from malignancy is not always possible with CT. MRI will further uh, help to examine involvement of soft tissue structures, both within the paranasal sinuses and detail any extra sinus involvement. Uh, disease will manifest with decreased attenuation on T1 and even, even lower attenuation on T2. Extra sinus extension will be demonstrated near areas of bony erosion. An indicator of invasive disease is seen with periantral soft tissue thickening around the maxillary sinus. And outside of the sinuses, disease is most prevalent in the orbit on imaging. Uh, other examples of invasive disease on imaging include cavernous sinus thrombosis, epidural abscess, or involvement of the infratemporal or pterygopalatine uh, fossas. Um, so here are some examples of CT findings for chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. Um, here we see an axial CT demonstrating hyperattenuating left maxillary sinus mass in both soft tissue and bone windows. And the mass has eroded the lateral wall of the sinus. And there's a lack of calcifications in the mass, which would typically be seen with, let's say, a mycetoma uh, and a lack of homogeneity. So here are characteristic MRI features. Uh, here you can see on T1 weighted imaging on the left, or panel C, um, you see decreased attenuation compared to, comparing to uh, surrounding structures. And on the right, uh, on T2 weighted imaging, um, you can see it's, it demonstrates a low signal uh, compared to non-necrotic mucosa and structures within the right nasal cavity and right maxillary sinus. So the goals of treatment are really twofold. And again, this is going to be directed surgical extirpation of fungal disease, as well as directed medical therapy. Um, a combination of endoscopic and open approaches is ideal, with failure rates being much greater in incomplete evacuation of disease or staged debridements with antifungals. Advanced disease may not be completely resectable and thus suppressive antifungal medications may be required. Um, antifungal therapy choice should be directed as results of fungal culture microscopy. Aspergillus flavus, the most common etiologic fungus of chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, can be treated with similar dosing of amphotericin B as seen in uh, acute invasive fungal sinusitis. However, long-term suppression with itraconazole may be required if evacuation is incomplete or to prevent recurrence. So next we'll move on to chronic uh, granulomatous fungal sinusitis. 
Um, and here, chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis has been described as a primary uh, paranasal granuloma um, and as an indolent fungal sinusitis and was once categorized within chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. Um, symptoms are, again, at least 12 weeks in duration, again, uh, similar to chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. Um, and patients are most commonly infected in countries such as North Africa, India, Pakistan, um, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. A recent study found that up to 30% of patients with long-standing diagnoses of non-invasive fungal rhinositis were incidentally positive for chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis upon biopsy. So patients with um, chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis present with signs and symptoms similar to chronic invasive fungal, fungal sinusitis. Again, we already talked about um, symptoms are present for at least uh, 12 weeks, uh, but disease manifestations uh, are variable and uh, patients may present with a growing cheek mass, proptosis, diplopia, unilateral, unilateral painless proptosis, progressive visual loss, um, and facial pain are often very, very common presenting symptoms. Uh, contrary uh, to acute invasive fungal sinusitis, cell-mediated immunity must be intact to form characteristic non-caseating granulomas that are seen on histopathology. Uh, additionally, Langerhans cell type macrophages and fibrosis may also be present. Angioinvasion is typically not seen. So imaging modalities here, uh, again, are commonly going to be CT and MRI, as previously discussed, and the findings are largely similar to uh, chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. Uh, CT will demonstrate uh, homogeneity of soft tissue opacity, which is isodense or hypodense compared to muscle with no hyperattenuation within the mass. On MRI with contrast, you'll see moderate to intense homogeneous enhancement, and on T1, you'll see an intermediate signal versus a low signal on T2. Uh, sinus expansion is also relatively uncommon in this disease process, and bony erosion tends to be limited to sites of extra sinus extension. Here you also tend to see more paranasal sinus disease, um, or extra sinus disease, I should say, as opposed to just um, simply in the sinuses. So here are some characteristic imaging features. Um, on the left, um, um, Maturo et al. demonstrates an image um, looking at an axial contrast enhanced CT, demonstrating a hyperdense mass within the left ethmoid sinus in orbit. On the right, we see a T2-weighted MRI, which demonstrates a low signal intensity in the area of the left ethmoid sinus and medial orbit in a patient with one year of proptosis. So in terms of treatment, um, Again, it's relatively uh, similar to chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. Uh, here, the most common etiologic agent is Aspergillus flavus, and treatment follows a similar pathway to chronic invasive fungal sinusitis uh, with treatment of, um, with amphotericin B as a single agent, agent or in combination with itraconazole. Voriconazole may potentially be suited for early stages of disease. Uh, as itraconazole has been found to decrease recurrent rates in chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis. And of course, uh, surgical resection, if possible, is paramount. So in terms of conclusion, so invasive fungal sinusitis, whether acute or chronic, has a propensity to affect extra sinus structures, including the orbit and brain. Most invasive fungal sinus disease uh, requires a combination of surgery and antifungal therapy. Acute invasive fungal sinusitis requires reversal of, a of the compromising state for successful treatment of disease and reduced mortality. Chronic invasive fungal sinusitis often affects immunocompetent patients and is due to, and is due to its indolent nature may un go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed uh, for some time. Chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis is similar to chronic invasive fungal sinusitis in its manifestation, but has unique geographical and histopathological findings. So some key points to remember, uh, AIFS is uh, less than four weeks in duration and is diagnosed with biopsy of affected mucosa. CT and MRI findings are important, as well as microscopy demonstrating hyphal invasion into the um, submucosal structures. Prompt antifungal therapy, surgical debridement, and reversal of the immunocompromised status is key. Delayed diagnosis, neutropenia, and non-surgical treatment surgical treatment are all associated with disease failure. Chronic invasive fungal sinusitis and chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis both uh, have a duration of greater than 10 weeks and are again diagnosed with biopsy when possible, CT and MRI. 
And here, uh, these demonstrate characteristics of non-caseating granulomas on histopathology. That is going to be true for chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis. For both of them, suppressive therapy may re be required for residual disease. And in all of these um, forms of fungal sinusitis, a multidisciplinary approach is really critical, involving um, ENT, ophthalmology, and neurosurgery in order to have successful extirpation of invasive fungal disease. Uh, so here are some suggestive suggested readings, and I will end with my resources. Thank you all for joining me today. It was really nice to, to be here and talk with you, and I hope you've learned a lot from today's talk. <laughs>